David Dubelet is one of the world's finest underwater photographers. He's been with National Geographic since 1971 and he is utterly mesmerised by his work, which all began at a summer camp back in the US at the tender age of eight. David Dubelet, welcome to Saturday Extra. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. Now, yeah. I know you've told the story many times, but you were at school camp, I gather, very reluctantly as an eight-year-old when the magic of taking a photograph hit you? Oh, they sent us all to camp. If you lived in New York City uh, in the 1950s and growing up there, you were shipped to summer camp. And uh, this is in the Adirondack Mountains. And I had asthma. I didn't like the horses very much or archery. So they sent me down to the waterfront and they said, here, kid, try on this mask. And I remember it distinctly, a beautiful little French blue mask. And I put it on, molded it to my face and put my head underwater, and my life changed completely. Really? I mean, right before me was this world with shafts of light and green algae flowing back and forth, and a giant water spider, dock spider, that the counselors thought I would be scared completely of, and I, I loved it. And I could move, I, my lungs floated, I felt wonderful. I felt it more at home underwater than I ever felt on the land. So the, the water was this magic moment, but what about the business of taking pictures? I wanted to be a photographer underwater. For some reason, this changed. And by the time I was 12, this is what I wanted to do. And, and the first, uh, first camera was a, a brownie hawkeye. My father bought a, uh, a rubber bag, an anesthesiologist bag, home from the hospital. He was a professor of surgery at NYU in New York. And we put our brownie hawkeye in the bag and put it together with an old diving mask. And lo and behold, here was an underwater camera. And I began to take these pictures, uh, pictures that I knew that were going to instantly catapult me into success and becoming a National Geographic photographer at age 12. They were going to just scoop me up. And, <laughs> and that was the end of it. The, the first pictures, of course, were, were incredibly awful and uh, beyond abstract. And... Is there a particular location or aspect of marine life that, that just captivated you, that you became slightly obsessional about? Somehow, but I've become more or less a generalist. I, I adore the coral reefs, and yet, even though we're new to the, uh, to the ice, Jennifer and I, my, my partner Jennifer Hayes, who is a marine biologist and a photographer and a journalist, we came uh, lately to the ice, and I adore that. I, I love the ice and the way the ice looks in the Antarctic Peninsula or in the Gulf of St. Lawrence more than anything else now. And yet there's then the waters of Tasmania. Tasmania is a secret gem. This is beneath the cliffs, uh, very close to Hobart in a place called Eagle Hawk Neck where the cliffs are 300 feet, 100 meters high. The, they plunge very deeply. It's deep water, very close to shore, and it's full of incredible animals. Everything from the, the red hand fish to the elephant fish that comes up and, and breeds in the shallow water. All sorts of things there. Mm. Tasmania is the outback beyond the outback for underwater. Is and that it's right? gorgeous. Uh, is that word spreading? Like, is that known? Or are you sort of one of the pioneers who's found this? Well, we did a story there uh, in the mid-90s, and it was very popular. And people began to come little by little, more and more. And I think that it still remains a destination that's less known to other places, but it's one of the finest of all temperate water diving. Right. Temperate water is that diving between the warm water of the tropics and the absolute freezing water of the poles. Temperate water is, is beautiful. And there's Tasmania in one corner of the Pacific and, of course, Vancouver and the ins Inside Passage and the world of uh, British Columbia on the other corner of the Pacific. I want to know, because I'm not a photographer, regrettably, how do you take such beautiful photographs when the lighting, it's so dark? There isn't lighting <laughs> after just a few metres. I'm intrigued. Well, yeah, that's exactly right, Geraldine. You go underwater, and in the first three feet, red begins to change. In 10 feet, it's maroon. and 60 feet, 20 metres, it's uh, now black. Red is black. The water, even the clearest water, absorbs light that way. So you bring down strobes, underwater electronic flashes, and what they do is they restore the, the spectrum of light there. And the reef blooms with color, unexpected, unpredictable. In the blink of an eye, you don't even see it until you look at the uh, visual, uh, the digital capture in the old days uh, film. 
and there's this unbelievable color. But that's not enough. You have to think of yourself as a photographer. And we swim around with these large cameras. They have large curved front elements to them, domes, as you will, as it were. So it's about the size of a small uh, microwave oven and two arms with two strobes on the ends of each arm. Sometimes we'll take three or four strobes down with us. And you can't think of yourself as a, a paparazzi. You can't corner the fish in a dark nightclub and give it a zetz. You have to... Think of yourself as sort of Karsh of Ottawa with the hair light and rim light and everything else to light a fish up the way it should be. And, of course, fish hate to have their pictures taken. Do they? Oh, they're, they're worse than children, you know. I have about 100,000 images of fish heading south. <laughs> uh, for the most part, much of aquatic and uh, marine life is smaller than you are. And here you're confronting this creature and looks at you with turret eyes, and you're this enormous thing. You're blowing bubbles. You're making a hell of a lot of noise, and, and you have this, this deadly sort of death ray bread box in front of you. Yes, yes. Well, and, of course, you... you're not going to relax. The other thing I gather you feel is that the new generation of digital cameras offers you all sorts of possibilities um, that the older style did not when you go underwater. The digital revolution for underwater photography was fabulous for us. And just to give you an example, uh, I did a story that I went down the entire length of the Red Sea. This is 1991. And I took 10 underwater camera systems. That's the bread box and the two strobes and everything else, 10 of them. Uh, and if I shot every single camera on a single dive, which would have been impossible, I would have shot a total of 360 pictures. Now, no underwater photographer these days goes underwater with a card that has only 360 pictures. We have 1,000 pictures, yeah. 500 pictures. And when I did that story in the Red Sea, I never saw the pictures I made for three months. It was total guesswork. It was big casino photography. Hmm. And now you take a picture and you have an image. You can correct the image. You can see what the mistakes you're making. You see the... Uh, the moment. You're not supposed to do this uh, while you're shooting, but at times you have to check. And you've developed something, I gather, called the split lens camera. A split lens picture is a picture where you're half in and half out of the water. I wasn't the developer of it, but I took the uh, technology a little bit farther, which I loved. And I loved it because of a quote from Jacques Cousteau in his book, The Silent World. That's the one I read under the covers with, with a flashlight when I was 10 years old. And he wrote about his first time going underwater. He, he had a pair of Frenet goggles. These are the goggles that aviators used, and they put putty in them so they were waterproof. This is 1930, in the mid-30s. And he looked above water and he said, I saw trolley cars, I saw light poles, I saw people on the shingle of the beach. And he put his head underwater and he said this wonderful quote, when I put my head underwater, civilization vanished with one last bow. And that was wonderful. Wonderful, because that's what I, that's what the kind of pictures that I wanted to take, mm. because you have this molecular, this molecular thin curtain that divides the world of air and the world of water on this planet. And of course, the world of water beneath this molecular thin curtain, this surface, as you were, is 70% of our planet. And the difference between the two, you want to illustrate in, in such a way that it's more mesmerizing than simply making an underwater picture. I mean, you've been photographing the oceans and marine life for, I think, five decades now. What changes have you seen? Most of the changes I've seen are due to the intense amount of overfishing that uh, we've done throughout the planet. For instance, when I was 12 years old, I saw my first coral reef in the Bahamas. Here was a world of yellow sea fans and rivers of, of yellow and blue striped grunts flowing between the sea fans, and all of that disappeared, gone. That's one of the greater changes. The other change, if you want to know how climate is really changing, the best place to look is the works of a uh, colleague, James Balog, who has photographed the changing world of ice the disappearance of glaciers, the warming of the sea. And that's really the smoking gun or what I always call the smoking fish of underwater photography. Very hard to achieve. 
right now we're looking at these great changes. It's hard, but hard to actually capture. Yeah. So what I've tried to do with the pictures and the adventures that we've had is to make images that transcend the very needs of, of journalism. In other words, we're all conditioned to make images that push forward a story. Mm. Uh, if you can make an image that has a, a longer leg, a longer view, then you reach people. Mm. The hardest thing in the world in, in photography is to convince the unconvinced of the fragility and yet the importance of the oceans. David Dubelet, it's been wonderful to have you here and thank you again for being here and for all your images. Thank you very much. <laughs>